Dr. Edna Green Medford is a well-known historian and expert on Andrew Jackson and Abraham Lincoln. She spent eight years as chair of the history department at Howard University in Washington. She recently appeared before an audience at Purdue University in connection with the C-SPAN Center for Scholarship and Engagement. Over the past 20 years, she has also served as a member of C-SPAN's advisory team for the network's periodic surveys ranking U.S. presidents. Those participating in the questioning included students majoring in political science and communications. Dr. Medford, I have not told her what I'm going to ask her. <laughs> if Andrew Jackson, who you know a lot about, came back in this time period in the United States, what would he think? He would be pretty comfortable, I suspect. <laughs> uh, he was really um, a bit of a, I don't want to say rabble rouser, but he was someone who was very unconventional, uh, very hard-nosed, uh, made trouble for a lot of people, uh, certainly stirred up politics in a way that changed the nation, made the presidency stronger than it had ever been, uh, sort of uh, seized power for the presidency. Uh, and so I think that he would be comfortable in the environment, but a little frightened as well by what we have become in, in some ways, I think he would. The same question about Abraham Lincoln. Oh, he would be appalled. <laughs> <laughs> Lincoln was someone who cared so much about democracy. And I think that he would be disturbed that democracy seems to be threatened at this point. And I think that he would do the best he could to try to steer us in what he would consider to be the right direction. He, he gave his life, you know, in, in preserving the union. And I think he would see the union in danger at the moment. And so he would be very much concerned about it. A lot is being written now about history not being important. What, what do we not see about history that people should know about and why they should study it? Not the obvious thing. You've been doing this your whole life. You know, the saying, what is past is prologue. It, it is so important for us to know where we've been. How are we going to go forward into the future if we don't know the mistakes we made in the past, the great things that we did in the past as well? Uh, I, I just think that there's so much that we have to learn from history. And if we deny its importance, if we believe that anyone's history you know, is not important to the nation, then I think we're in big trouble. Uh, part of the problem I see today, or a major part of the problem actually, is Americans don't know their history, and when they do know it, they don't understand it, and they're too easy to deny it. And I think we, we don't move forward unless we grapple with that. What do they deny? They deny anything that's negative about the history, not realizing that every country has had its downside. No country has been perfect. Uh, America certainly has not been perfect either. And so we need to recognize that. We need to acknowledge that we can't move forward if we don't understand the issues that we had then and, and how they impact what's going on now. This may be unfair, <clears throat> but as a historian, and I know we're living through it right now, what do you think the four or five things a historian will write about this period oh my in goodness. 25 years? Politics, politics, politics. It'll all be, it, it'll be about, well, it depends upon how we respond to what's happening today. Because we don't know. The story isn't over. We're in a time where we are in crisis as a nation, but we don't know how it's going to end. So I think it depends upon what Americans do collectively to solve the problems of today. So if we do what is best for the nation, and I think if we are serious, we can agree about what's best for the nation. If we do that, then I think history will look on us very favorably. But if we decide that government is the problem and we don't have to do anything as citizens except live through whatever is happening, 
then history is not going to look too kindly on us. I, I think that it's so easy to say that this is someone else's problem, and as long as it's, it doesn't affect me, I don't need to get involved. But as a citizen, you are required to get involved. I truly believe that we have the government and the society that we deserve if we don't do something about the issues we have. So it's our responsibility to do why, something. Why is this not a great period of the success of democracy? I think we've become very selfish. Um, I mean, we've always, in America, when you look at American history, you think about, you know, how people are self-made, a lot of people are self-made. Uh, it's this rugged individualism. I think the problem is we've become too individualistic. We've become too concerned about how what's happening is going to either improve our condition or make it worse, as opposed to looking at the nation collectively and saying, this is the road that we should take, as opposed to what road's going to help me get more power and more wealth. I think that once we abandon the idea that everyone should have opportunity, that everyone should have all the rights of other citizens, then we go down the same road as those countries who di that didn't survive, the, the great societies that didn't survive because their leaders and the people themselves became very selfish. Who is a Hoosier by the name of William Trail? Ah, <laughs> I should say, first of all, I'm writing a book uh, with a co-author, um, Charles Hubbard of Lincoln Memorial University. He's retired now. And he, uh, several years ago, discovered nine letters from this uh, Civil War soldier named Benjamin Trail. And so we were simply going to annotate the letters. And so as we looked at the letters more closely, we realized that there was a family story there. And so we started researching the history of the patriarch of the family, William Trail, who was uh, an African-American born into slavery in Montgomery County, Virginia. Excuse me, Montgomery County, Maryland. I've got Virginia on my mind because I'm from Virginia. Um, he was taken to South Carolina at the age of five and uh, was sold at least twice uh, during his, in his youth. And when he was 30 years old, in 1814, near the end of uh, the War of 1812, made his way to southeastern Indiana, apparently by himself. So he escaped his bondage went to Henry County, actually he, he went to Fayette and Franklin counties first, then went on to Henry uh, County, uh, Indiana, and had seven sons. Four of them served in the Civil War on the Union side. Uh, one of the, two of them died while in the military. One committed suicide two years after returning home. The others became very prominent leaders of the community but this is a family where the patriarch was just truly exceptional. He, um, he made a deal with his owner to uh, allow him to work one day a week for himself. And he promised that he would purchase his own, his own clothes and his own food if he allowed him to do that. The owner finally agreed for him to do it. He purchased a colt from his owner's youngest son. And so he would dress up on Sunday afternoons and ride around the county with his finest clothes and his horse. And so he just decided at some point that he couldn't continue to live as an enslaved man. So he freed himself. And he, there was an attempt to re-enslave him at least twice, maybe three times. And he always went to court and he won. And the, the last time they tried to enslave him, and he, and he won, he actually put an ad in the paper giving a reward to anyone who captured the two men who tried to re-enslave him. So this is a man who has run away from slavery, but he knows, I think he understands what freedom is. You don't have to have ever been free to understand what freedom is. And he truly believed, I think, that he was worthy of the same freedom and equality as other men. So he couldn't read, never learned to read and write, but he understood what American democracy was. And he insisted to his children 
that they fight for their freedom as well. I mean, they were free men, they were born free, but they didn't have equality of opportunity. And so the story that we're writing is about this man and his family and how they are embracing American democracy and insisting that they have the same rights as other people. So tomorrow, I know you're gonna go to, is it Trailsville? Trails Grove. Trails, Trails Grove. Grove. I, try, I tried to find it on the map and I didn't succeed. It's near Shirley, it's near Shirley, Indiana. So. Uh, what are you gonna do when you get there? I'm going to put on my mud boots and I'm going to trape through a cornfield until I get to the cemetery for the Trail family. And I'm going to pay homage to them and I'm going to take down names of the people. I'm, I'm praying that there are still names on the tombstones. So the cemetery is actually located in a cornfield. And so I have a lovely uh, researcher from Indianapolis who's going to take me there on, on Friday morning. So we will stay all day at Trails Road, just looking at the terrain. So what do you, what, who, you, in your own mind, who are you writing this for? It's, you know, I, we are hoping that scholars will have an interest in it. I mean, it's, it'll be very well documented. We have incredible documents for this man. Uh, he, he does make a deal uh, with his owner the first time that he's, they try to capture him. He makes a deal with his owner to pay for his freedom. And so the owner charges him $300 in, in 1814. And so he pays $25 the, immediately, 75 in two weeks and $100 for the next two years. How he got that kind of money, I don't know. I suspect it was through the Quakers. The Quakers were very active in the area. And the two men who signed on his behalf were Quakers, I believe. And so he probably borrowed the money from them and paid them back. And so we have these documents, you know, all of this is documented. It's not just oral tradition. There are documents associated with this as well. I know you've studied a lot about enslaved people. What does the average American know about slavery? Not much. Not much at all. Um, my own students, I think, when I started at Howard in 87, didn't know much about slavery because they had gone to schools where they didn't teach African American history. The school I went to, you know, I was in a county that was 82% African American. I never learned African American history there. I, I learned about George Washington Carver and the peanut, you know, the fact that all of these inventions had come through the peanut. But that was about it. Um, not even about Nat Turner. I mean, there was a little piece in the, in the textbook about Nat Turner, but Nat Turner was, was bad. Certainly he wasn't doing anything that was good. But not, but students do now. I mean, we, we make an effort to teach them who they are. But the problem is, I think the average American does not understand what slavery was. We look at it as just an economic institution, and so what? You know, uh, you got your, you, know, you didn't get compensated for your work, you know, but people gave you a home to live in, which was really a hovel, you know, and gave you food to eat, which was really, you know, corn and, and fat back, you know, the worst part of the, the hog. And so they don't understand that slavery was an institution of social control as well. And so you keep people enslaved, whether it's profitable to you or not, because there comes a time when, uh, especially in Virginia and Maryland, slavery is not as profitable because they're not growing the kinds of products that will bring them a lot of money. So they have all of these enslaved laborers. You either free them or you, uh, you know, hire them out to a local industry or something, and that's usually what happens. Or you simply pull up stakes and you take your enslaved laborers and your whole family to the Deep South. That happens a lot. But when I look at slavery, it's not the economic piece, it's not the economic exploitation, it's separating families. You know, it's having Christmas come when people are celebrating, but a few days later, on January 1st, you know that someone's going to be sold. 
or you're going to have to go back to that place where you've been hired out. But usually, you're going, to have, you're going to be sold. Your children are going to be sold from you. Wives can't, you know, be with their husbands. Husbands can't protect their wives. You know, women raped. Uh, all kinds of hideous things that are happening socially and emotionally. So it's not just about exploitation of labor. It's about beating people down, trying to dehumanize them. Because I would think, you know, I've tried to look at it from the perspective of um, someone who may have owned an enslaved person. It's difficult to do, but I've tried to do that. And I think the only thing that explains what happened in terms of the, the, the tearing people down is, how can you be a human being and treat someone else that way unless you justify it as, well, we're doing them a favor. You know, they were in Africa and they were backwards, they were barbarians, they didn't have anything. Well, in Africa, they had a lot. They had their families intact. They had their culture. They had their society. And then they were ripped away, brought to America, sold, separated from their families, if their families even survived, you know, to get to uh, America's shores, and then labor for someone and be abused by someone for the rest of your life. That's no life at all. But I don't think the average American even understands that that's what happened. Want to get to the students in the room who are here to ask some questions? I don't know where the microphones are, but let's, um, let's do that. I'll ask one more question, and then we'll go to the first student question. What was the difference when you raised your daughter in our society compared to the way you were raised? Yeah, so I was raised in a segregated environment, first and foremost. I did not have classes with non-black students until I went to graduate school. I did not have a white teacher until I went to college. I was in a rural environment. Uh, my parents were very strict. Uh, my mother especially was very strict. My father was a little lenient because all he had to do was look at us and <laughs> sort of did whatever he wanted. He didn't have to raise his hand or anything. My mother was a little different. My daughter grew up in an environment where we taught her to be open and inclusive and respectful of the rights of all people. She went to school with, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she went to school with uh, students uh, the, most of the schools she, she was in um, were schools where there was a white majority. And so I did become concerned at one point that she was not getting the kind of cultural background that she needed except what she was getting at home. And I remember the day that I felt a little bit more comfortable because um, I found, she never put anything back. We had a library of books and she never put a book back. She would uh, lie out on the floor and read and leave the book there. But I remember one day walking in and she was still a little girl and she had a book open that was about African American history. And so she didn't tell me she was reading it, but she did it on her own. And she hated history. Uh, you know, she was a political science major, and I think she hated history because both parents had been history majors, so you know how kids are who want to do something different from their parents. But I noticed that at the dinner table, when my husband and I were talking about Lincoln or the Civil War or something, she would chime in. And I'm thinking, how do you know that? You know, if you hate history so much, how do you know these things? So I'm delighted that she had such a diverse experience. I think it, it's what makes her a better person today. I think we all need to expose ourselves to other cultures and other people. I think we have a better understanding of the world when we're allowed to do that. Dr. Medford went to Howard, went to Maryland, and went to Illinois. No, no. went to Hampton. Hampton, Institute. Hampton University. Hampton Institute. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> Newport News, yes. Let's get to the students. Will? Hi, Brian. Hi, Dr. Medford. It's Hi. great to have you both here. My question today is about public ed or about education. Uh, Dr. Medford, with your experience as an educator, both as a professor, um, I'm curious what you believe the current threats are in the education system, whether that's K through 12 or uh, at a university level. And then what do we do as students or as educators to help prevent those threats? Mm -hmm. The biggest problem we have today in terms of education, well, there are several big problems. One is we don't pay teachers enough, okay? We don't honor what teachers do, first and foremost. <laughs> And secondly, it frightens the heck out of me to know that people are trying to pass laws, are passing laws, that make it impossible for us to teach certain history in the classroom. I don't understand how you say a child can't learn about the history of the country, the true history of the country, you know, bad and good. So if you're going to ban books, if you're going to tell teachers what they should teach, if you're going to be concerned about a child being offended, that's ridiculous. You know, I mean, you've got to teach them the truth. How does a legislator determine what should be taught in the classroom? Or how can they tell a teacher how to teach? If we don't get that straight, we're going to have even bigger problems in this country. And if we don't start paying our teachers more, we're going to have bigger problems too. People don't want to teach. People don't want to teach already because they're having to deal with students who have been, um, I don't want to say privileged because I think it's true of students in general at the elementary and high school level that they don't, they don't respect teachers and I think they don't respect teachers because they don't respect parents. You know? I, I had a conversation with um, a police officer uh, just a week or so ago. I, I was involved in um, a program called um, Returning Citizens Task Force. And the idea is to find housing or, or to convince the legislature that housing needs to be found for people who are returning from incarceration. Because if you don't find proper housing for them, if you don't find jobs for them, if you don't start helping them make wise decisions, you're going to have another problem because they are going to come back to your communities and they're going to cause problems like they did before. So you start helping them reintegrate into the society. And so I was talking with this police officer who's very much concerned about this as well. And he was telling me about an incident where he was called in. There was a domestic issue. He, he, was, he was called in to assist. And while he was there, the student tried to attack his mother while the police officer is there. So if you don't have respect for your parents, you don't have respect for members of your community. You're not going to have respect for your teacher either. And you're not going to have much respect for yourself. When I was growing up many, many, many years ago, it wasn't just my parents who disciplined me. It was my community. So I remember having a neighbor who saw if, if we did anything wrong, we got spanked by her before we got home. I mean, really. And then she would call my mother and say, Oh, I spanked Edna because I saw her doing such and such. And she was not that much older than, I think she may have been about 10 years older. But she felt responsible for me. I didn't do that very much. I mean, it was usually my sister who got the spanking, <laughs> not me. But yeah, it really is about lack of respect, I think, um, in, in terms of how students are dealing with, with teachers. So parents need to teach students that their teachers should be respected. Thank you, Dr. Medford. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, Dr. Medford. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my question is, how much do you think the cultural differences between the North and South in the 1800s have to do with the cultural differences between the North and South today? <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> 
You know, I don't... <laughs> we used to think wrongly that prejudices and racism and, and these other negatives were a Southern phenomenon. They're not, and they never have been. Uh, I, I think that culturally, the North has, has adopted certain characteristics in the South, not all bad. You know, I, I think about line dancing and that kind of thing. It, it's, it starts in the South and then it comes North. You know, I, I see in the city, you know, uh, cowboy boots and, and hats, you know, in the North. Um, if you're talking about some of the difficult times, if you're talking about um, uh, voter suppression, that used to be a Southern thing. It's a northern thing as well now. I mean, the, the issues are just as prominent in the north. I tend to be more comfortable in the north because I know that if someone does not like me, they will let me know it instantly. <laughs> but in the south, it might, be, might take a little bit more time to, to get to me, or I'll see it based on how things are occurring. So I may have more difficulty voting. Uh, in certain areas, or I won't go into a certain neighborhood after dark still, you know. But uh, I don't see that much of a difference culturally between the two areas. Um, I think there's still, though, a kind of milita military-centered um, atmosphere in the South still. I mean, that kind of thing has always been a part of the South. I don't see that as much in the North. But I think some of the same issues that we have um, sort of tied to the South are also very obvious in the North as well. Matt. Hi, Brian. Hi, Dr. Medford. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. My question is, what do you think was the biggest impact of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and why are they still important today? Oh, yeah, the biggest impact was it elevated Lincoln. <laughs> Even though he didn't win uh, the, the um, election, he did not become the U.S. Senator from Illinois, but it did elevate uh, his presence. And it also gave the country an opportunity to think long and hard about slavery, to look at the issues. And, and I, you know, I always argue that the debates were not just about slavery, although we know they were about slavery, but the debates at bottom, they were about equality. Uh, acceptance. Uh, so, I mean, if you just look below the surface, and sometimes you don't even have to look below the surface, they're actually saying that. So when you have Lincoln saying, you know, I, I have no intention of, you know, I don't believe in political and social equality for black people. And Stephen A. Douglas says it in a way that's certainly much cruder than that. You know, he's very obvious about how he feels. But it was important then because it did bring attention to what was dividing the nation. And so anyone who thinks that the Civil War was about states' rights, uh-uh. <laughs> it was about keeping slavery. And if you don't believe it, all you have to do is look at the ordinances of secession that the southern states passed, or look at the debates they had. Start with the Mississippi ordinance. They say it in the first paragraph. Slavery is central to our way of life. So not about states' rights. It's about slavery. And so those debates certainly elevated that argument and actually, I think, eventually does push us closer to the Civil War. They're important today because we can learn, you know, what happens when the country is divided and you know, there's, there's no ability to agree. Actually, I'm grateful <laughs> that there was no compromise uh, and that war did occur, because if war had not occurred, black people probably would have continued to be enslaved into the 20th century. There was absolutely no reason for slaveholders to get rid of slavery. So because the war came, and because Lincoln saw the opportunity 
to expand the war effort and to get more recruits for the Union Army and to do the right thing as well, because you can do that. You can do the right thing and do something that's going to be to your advantage or to the nation's advantage. If not for that war, we wouldn't have gotten to uh, 1865. We wouldn't have gotten to the Union winning. We wouldn't have gotten to the 13th Amendment. Thank you. Nathan. Hello, Dr. Medford. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Nathan Miller. I'm a junior in political science and economics. Uh, my question is this. Um, you know, when uh, Brian asked you about what will people remember, uh, you know, in the future about this moment in history, uh, it got me thinking that there's so much uh, that ultimately gets left out. You know, I feel everybody knows more about what's happening today than they know about the past. So. Uh, with history, so many details get left out, or when you relay history to somebody, you, you tell a story about history, so many details get left out. Uh, how do you do that as a historian in a, in a responsible way that uh, makes understanding our history possible without, you know, perhaps weaving a narrative? You know, some people do it maliciously that is not accurate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I, I've had a couple of colleagues tell me once that it was not the role of the historian to give everyone the opportunity to express themselves, that you're interpreting the past, and so you can interpret it however you wish. That's not so. I think it's the responsibility of the historian to get as close to the truth as you possibly can. Now, we may never get there completely. People who live it don't necessarily know what the truth is. If we're looking at what's happening today, each one of us is going to remember it differently, and we will interpret it through our own lens. So the, the, the dirty little secret is that historians bring baggage to the table. We all see history differently. I'm a black, middle-aged, I guess I'm elderly now. Okay? <laughs> I'm a black, older woman who grew up in the South in a rural environment. I have a very, I am socially conservative probably, but racially very liberal, uh, and liberal in other ways as well. Um, and so I'm going to look at history in a certain way, but I think I go out of my way to be balanced. I try to understand the position of the other person, knowing that I'm never going to fully understand anybody's position that lived during that period. And then I try to tell the story. But it's always going to be from my perspective. But I have to keep it as close to the truth as I possibly can. Mackenzie? Hello, Dr. Medford. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Mackenzie Michaelby, and I'm a freshman studying political science and economics. Um, Where are these political science folk coming from? Where are the historians? <laughs> Where are the history majors in here? Wow, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Oh, I was wondering what your biggest takeaway has been from teaching classes in 19th century African American history. Wow, that's a big one. It's that's, a big that's, one. Yeah. Um, that I think students, once you get them in the classroom and you make the history interesting to them and relevant to them, they will stick with you. Um, that hasn't always been the case. I really struggled in my earlier years. I had students who come back now and tell me, oh, you were really great. And I'm saying, don't lie, you know? <laughs> I remember what I was like. Um, but I think that it got better. I understood how I needed to bring that story to them. But yeah, I, you know, it, the idea that students take history because they have to take history, if they're still requiring history to be taken. But um, I think they can enjoy it. Uh, I think they can learn a lot from it. I do try to teach them that we have to be inclusive. So when I teach US history, for instance, I don't just talk about you know, the, the main guys, you know, the founders, and you know, that kind of thing. I try to incorporate the people who put those, those leaders in position, because they would be nothing without the people. But I also try to talk about the indigenous population. 
I talk about immigrant groups that are coming in at any point in time. And I bring in people of color as well. Uh, so for African American history, I'm teaching it from the perspective of people of African descent with the understanding that they don't live in a vacuum. Things are impacting them that would impact anyone else. It just may be impacting them differently. And so that's what I'm trying to convey to the students. Thank you. Chad. Hi, Dr. Medford. Hi, Hi. My name is Chad. I'm a senior in political science and economics, but I have a minor in history. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> And my favorite C-SPAN uh, side project is the presidential survey to all the historians. And so I was excited to see you coming because I know you were an advisor on it for the 2021 survey where they ranked the presidents. And so I'd really love to know what it was like being an advisor for that and what you think about Abraham Lincoln being number one all four times. And then maybe what's your favorite metric by which you grade our presidents? Oh, that's a great one. Terrific. So let, let me say... Uh, Abraham Lincoln deserves first place. I, I know that there are issues with him. No one's perfect, okay? But in terms of the issues he had to deal with, in terms of how he tried to handle them, I think he deserves to be first place. Uh, the way I judge people is the, well, the most important for me, okay, is the one on, um, I think with moral authority, it, the, the idea that you're treating, no, uh, pursuit of equal rights for all, that's the one. And it's easy to do the survey if you keep that in mind. I mean, you can only give them a certain number of points for that. But that's the most important one to me, pursued equal justice for all. Uh, and I think that Lincoln does that. He, I'm not sure how, if I rated him number one in that or not. But certainly, if you look at that moral authority, uh, how he's trying to communicate with the country and so forth, um, the kinds of issues, he, uh, crisis management, for instance, I think those are, are very important. And could I ask a follow-up question, Brian? Thanks, Brian. Could I, I was wondering, <laughs> what, <laughs> what was your, what do you think of the fact that Abraham Lincoln is always ranked number one but on either side of him are Buchanan and Johnson, and they are also in turn ranked last and second to last respectively on every time. What is up, what is up with that phenomenon? Why is it <laughs> the number one guy is in between the two last place people? What do you mean the number one guy is in between? Because uh, it went Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson, and or in chronological order in history, that is. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then on the survey, Buchanan's last place, Johnson's second to last yes, place. Yes, yes. Well, I, you know, I, I flippantly would say because the other two were idiots, <laughs> but, but let me not say that, uh, although I've already said it. Um, it's because those two men did not rise to the occasion. Buchanan sat there in the White House and did nothing as the southern states suited. Uh, so he did nothing to help the situation. Lincoln comes in. He's got a tough thing to do. He does do it. He does it slower than I would have liked him to, but he does eventually do it. Johnson, until recently, I would think he he's, was the president that was the most unfit for office, uh, until recently. Okay. Um, sorry, Brian, I know. <laughs> Um, he, you know, Lincoln was so much stronger and so much more deliberative than Johnson that it would have been a tough act to follow anyway. But Johnson, and I, I tried to feel sympathy for him, <laughs> he's this man who grew up poor in the South, uh, was shunned by the wealthy people, and when he gets into a position of authority, he just gives it all up. You know, he hates them initially. And then they have to come to him to get personal pardons. And then all of a sudden, he's one of the boys. And so he forgets that he has an obligation to the entire nation, which includes the 4 million African Americans who just received their freedom. And so he gives up that sacred duty 
to rub elbows with these rich men and to do favors for them. And for that, and you just cannot get beyond that. He was just a very poor president. He was not up to the task. It's unfortunate that Lincoln did not choose someone else as a running mate, but I guess he didn't know he was gonna be assassinated. You got another question, Chad? <laughs> Give me a minute, I can think of one. <laughs> Turn it over to Jack. Jack, you're next. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jack Barton. I'm a freshman here at Purdue. I study political science. Uh, <laughs> common theme. Um, and my question for you tonight, Dr. Mumford, comes from uh, more of an educational perspective. So just coming out of high school, I've gone through looking at textbooks, and I am kind of seeing the common theme that you're discussing about certain parts of our African-American history missing from textbooks or being disproportionately not represented. Mm -hmm. um, and I was curious on what you think the long-term effects of these practices are going to be and or how these problems are going to be addressed in the future or confronted. Mm -hmm. Well, we see the, the long-term effects already because people who see no value from their country are going to start questioning their value, okay? So you cannot have a part of the population that is denied, that, you know, they're not truly Americans, they just happen to be here. When you take that attitude and when you deny the issues they've had to deal with and how they've dealt with them, then that becomes problematic. And I would say it's not just the exclusion of African-American history, it's the exclusion or the de denial of assaults on the indigenous population as well. It's denial of the assault on Asian populations. So we've got lots of stuff happening in this country that does not directly impact African-Americans. It's impacting African-Americans, but it's also impacting Chinese who are coming in at a certain time, Japanese, other Asians, Slavic people. So this country has a history of not always treating immigrants the way we should. And so we're looking now at the, the latest population of people who are trying to immigrate to the United States. And we're trying to put the brakes on. And I understand you know, that there may be issues in certain parts of the country, but it is so cruel to me to say, you know, I, I think about the Statue of Liberty, that is such a joke now and has been in the past. Because at the same time, you had Emma Lazarus writing, you know, give me your tired, your poor. There was a man named Thomas Bailey Aldrich, I think his name was, who did a poem called um, The Gates Unguarded. And it was a racist, racist poem about how you have to keep out the Tartans and the, you know, the barbarians and all of these people who could not possibly value American democracy. And so we've always had that side of ourselves as a nation. And I'm not suggesting that all Americans feel this way, but enough feel this way that it is threatening what we are supposed to be to the world. And if we don't solve that problem now, uh, not just with African Americans, certainly with African Americans, but with immigrant groups as well, we really are going to lose our souls if we haven't already. Next. Uh, hi, my name is Keely. I'm a freshman uh, majoring in political science, but I do have minors in Spanish and history. Good. So don't <laughs> worry. Um, but I was just curious on your thoughts about critical race theory and kind of how polarizing that topic is right now mm -hmm. and kind of your hopes for our generation as we move forward and what you hope that we can do with that. Mm -hmm. now, the biggest problem with critical race theory is that nobody knows what it is. You know, I really, I mean, my definition of critical race theory is the idea that American institutions traditionally have been affected by racism. I don't think, I mean, I would think most people would see that, you know, so whether it's the criminal justice system or healthcare 
or housing or the labor system, whatever, we've got statistics to prove it. So why are we so worried about discussing it? First of all, it's not being discussed in elementary schools, for God's sake, you know, or high schools. It just isn't. It's like any other course on a university campus. So why people are getting so upset about that, it's, I just don't get it. I, I really don't. And I don't think, I mean, it's a dog whistle. It is really, it's not a real thing. It is not something that's really threatening the nation. But it's it gives people an ability to complain about their loss of power. That's what all of this is about. Loss of power because of changing demographics or the fear of loss of power because of changing demographics. So I think we need to put critical race theory, the fear of it at least, to rest. I see no problem discussing it, but we need to put that fear to rest because it simply does not pose a danger to the nation. That's my perspective, at least. Okay. Amari. Hi, I'm Amari Wilson. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Beffer, for coming and speaking with us. Um, I'm a political science major. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I want to ask you a question about your book, A Trail and the, the Chronicling of an Enslaved Person in mm -hmm. Indiana. Um, how important would you say individual histories are in impacting the broader narrative of history um, versus like a sociological perspective? Absolutely. Everybody's story is a piece of history, okay? And so someone like Trail is important to me because he was not a Frederick Douglass. You know, he was not a big guy who everybody, well, not everybody loved Frederick Douglass, but, you know, he was not famous. He was the average man who decided that he deserved dignity. And he was going to raise a family that understood that they deserved dignity as well. And he went for it. That's a part of the story that we don't always tell. I think too frequently, even now when we, we've been talking for years about African-American agency under slavery, there are still stories that we haven't told. So this is a story about one man and one family struggle for freedom and democracy and equality. And I think that we add to the larger narrative when we look at these little tiny slices of history. Uh, I certainly, I mean, I've, stud I've been studying African American history for, <laughs> let me not tell you how long I've been studying <laughs> African American history, my entire adult life. And I'm still learning things that I didn't know before. And I think that's important because just as we talk about how horrible the experience in America has been for some people, we need to also talk about the ability of people to thrive even under that, that the kind of, of insistence that they bring to their lives. We need to talk about people like William Trail, who were successful despite all the stuff they had to deal with. Um, I don't like victimization history. Uh, we, we have suffered. I understand that. And that story needs to be told. But the stories of triumph need to be told as well. And I've learned that from a student years and years and years ago when I was standing in the classroom as a young professor giving the victimization speech. And I remembered one of my students actually jumping up and saying, well, Dr. Medford, if everything is so negative, why do I need to be here? And I thought, yeah, you know, why am I teaching history this way? And so they get the victim stuff, but they also get the stuff that shows that the human spirit can survive some of this, not everyone does. But there is, there are instances where people are able to succeed despite all of the stuff they've had to deal with. Mackenzie, I'm gonna to skip to Sophie because we're running out of time. Let her get a question in. We'll see how much time we have left. 
Hi, Dr. Medford. My question has to deal more with academia as a whole and maybe your experience. Obviously, you have your PhD. How do you feel about the lack of transparency on funding in PhD programs and maybe the access to resources for international students or, you know, just unequal opportunities in that field in general? For international students or just for everyone? For everyone, but mm -hmm. specifically, I know from you know personal experience, my sister is getting her PhD right now, mm -hmm. and the international students there are treated very unfairly, and oftentimes their work under their PI, you know, sometimes oh, yeah. being mm -hmm. here is held over their head, and it's it's a big problem that I don't think is talked about. So maybe if you have some insight. Yeah, you know, our universities have a hard time funding graduate programs. Um, I've had students who have left the PhD program in history with a debt of over $200,000. You know, I mean, it, it happens much more frequently than you might think. And it's not because the university's not giving out money. They're giving out as much as they can, but the universities, it's expensive to run a university. I'm talking like this because I've been an administrator for four years. I, I'm sure I didn't talk like this when I was a professor. But, but I understand now some of the issues that universities have. But you're absolutely right. No student should have to you know, spend you know, a few years getting a degree and then have to pay you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. That just really messes up your whole life. I mean, you know, it takes so long to pay that kind of thing back. So I always tell my students, though, um, universities don't, I mean, some universities are charging much less. First of all, you don't have to go to the top tier school to get a good education. Go to a good, solid school that can either fund you or it's going to be much cheaper than the big Ivy League or, or whatever. Students now, though, I think they want those credentials they, from the major universities. And I, I just think that education is just too expensive now for everyone to think that they're going to be able to do that. Um, I, I went to the University of Illinois and the University of Maryland. I was lucky. Um, I got teaching assistantship positions uh, and, 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 fellow, and, and a fellowship finally at the University of Maryland for one year. But I, it was, they were both state schools, and they weren't that expensive. But the private schools are extremely expensive. And so I just tell students, you know, you don't have to go to, um, you know, Harvard or Yale or Princeton, you know, Columbia or whatever. Go to a solid state school where you're going to be paying much less money, but you're going to get as great an education as you would from the big name schools. Thank because you. we're out of time, the three of you characters that are still standing, just <laughs> ask a quick question, and, and we're going to go through all three of them, and then let uh, Edna try to combine all the answers. <laughs> Avi, in your case, Avi, make it very short, please. Yeah, I, I got a much shorter question, don't worry. Uh, earlier, you said that you, quote, try to be balanced. Given the current political climate, how do we inspire the rest of the nation to adopt this mindset as well? Thank you. Nathan. Uh, I had a question about what role do you think history should play in our uh, political institutions? And uh, I'm thinking maybe Supreme Court. And do you trust uh, these institutions to factor in a history that you know, represents everyone in the country? <laughs> Mackenzie. I was just wondering how you got involved with the William Trail research since we're kind of far in Indiana from your home state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was actually a project that was brought to me by my colleague at Lincoln Memorial University, Charles Hubbard, who had been working on the project for a while himself and just felt that uh, an African-American voice <laughs> would be good in this study because he had not done African-American history. And so he invited me to come on as a co-author and it's been long and, you know, unfortunately, longer than either of us would like, uh, but it, it's working out. So, and in terms of the... His, history, that we're talking about the Supreme Court. And yeah. What? I would make those folk learn their history, first and foremost. I would make them go back to school 
and take courses that showed what America was supposed to be based on the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, given, of course, that the Constitution had to be amended because it excluded so many people. But they need to understand what the society was supposed to be or what it could have been. And then maybe if they understood that, they would make better decisions. I would take politics out of things like the Supreme Court. It, it's, they shouldn't even be involved in, shouldn't even have a clue about what's happening politically. These are people who should be led by what's in the Constitution, and we know they don't. So, and the same thing is true for political parties. Your first priority should be what's best for the nation, not what's best for your party. And I don't care if that's Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever. And if you're not doing that, you're not being a good American citizen. So that's, and how we do that, how we inspire people to, to do, I don't think it's possible right now. Uh, I have become very negative. Um, I just don't see a way out of this at the moment. We are so divided. People are so fearful of losing power and position in society, they're forgetting that there's a whole nation that they should be concerned about. Let's thank Edna Madden, please. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.